Well, my name is Torsten. I'm one of the product managers at uh, Snowflake. And um, so this is a sponsored talk, so I'm by no means an FDB expert, but I do want to walk you through some of the highlights of Snowflake, which, as you know, is heavily using uh, FDB. Um, and you might have heard this before during the day. So uh, the, one of the foundations for Snowflake is what we call a multi-cluster shared data architecture. What it means is that we're very disciplined about separating compute from storage, and that gives us a number of interesting capabilities. So the first one is everybody that's uh, working on the same Snowflake account is working on the same data set. So they're all uh, seeing the same transactionally consistent view of the data, no matter which team or which part of the company is making changes to the, uh, to the data set. Um, in addition to that, um, you, if you have different teams or different departments in your company, you can uh, define and create independent compute resources that are powering your team, and they then get access to the shared data set. And they're independent of uh, whatever other teams are doing over the same data. This has a great benefit that you can do workload separation. So for instance, if you look into this busy picture here, at the top you can see there is data loading going on, ETL workloads are happening, and then the bottom you have, for instance, dashboarding uh, power users there using, for instance, Tableau to do BI. Um, whatever happens on the data loading side gets its own dedicated uh, compute resources. And you see this little SQL cluster that's sitting there. So that's the independent compute for data loading. And then at the bottom, you have uh, uh, different compute clusters that are powering the BI experience for users that are uh, using Tableau. So you have this workload separation. The other aspect is you can also scale these compute resources independently of each other. So for instance, if your data science team needs massive scale-out compute cap capacity, you can have that for them in a dedicated compute cluster, while other teams are working with much smaller clusters. And then the last point I want to mention here is uh, you can also give the same team multiple clusters. Uh, and that essentially gives you uh, the ability to uh, get virtually unlimited concurrency, so unlimited numbers of users or queries that are running at the same time over the same uh, data set. So let's drill a little bit into how we are doing this. So this is an architectural blueprint um, of the different layers that uh, Snowflake is, uh, is using. At the top, you see what we call uh, the cloud services, and essentially, they're, first of all, making sure that when a connection comes in, um, that you're uh, authorized and authenticated to work with Snowflake. And then as the query goes through the different layers, we are, uh, we are compiling a query plan. Uh, we're taking care of transaction management. Um, and all of that is backed by metadata that is uh, stored for all intents and purposes in, uh, in FDB. So once a query gets submitted for execution, then it goes into the second layer that you see here. This is where we uh, have our so-called virtual warehouses. Those are these uh, independent compute clusters that you saw on the previous slide. And they're connecting to the third layer at the bottom, which is uh, the, the data storage where Snowflake databases live. Um, what's nice about this is the tiered storage architecture, uh, architecture between level two and level three. So we're using the local memory and the local disks on the VMs that are powering this, this middle layer, the virtual warehouses. We are using that to cache any data that you uh, frequently use for, uh, for, for your queries. Um, and that, that saves a lot of round trips into remote storage um, uh, for, for the third layer. All right, looking at this storage, uh, this might be a term that you also have heard uh, earlier today. The way that uh, Snowflake organizes its, its, its data internally is uh, uh, into so-called micropartitions. And this is done automatically as the data is being loaded into Snowflake. We're taking the data and we're cutting it into uh, micropartitions that are a couple of uh, megabytes, maybe a few tens of megabytes in size. What we're doing as part of that is we're transforming the incoming data into a columnar representation, and we're also building up metadata structures that allow us to reason about what's contained in what partition. This gives us the ability to do pruning uh, during query processing at various levels. So first of all, because of the columnar representation, uh, we can discard uh, any, any, any columns that are not participating in the query. We don't need to touch those. And then in addition to that, the metadata gives us the ability to reason about which, which micropartitions may actually contribute results to the query that you have just submitted. Um, and for those where we are sure that they're not contributing, we don't need to touch those partitions either. Um, so that gives you great performance benefits. Um, 
uh, obviously. And these partitions are also the unit for uh, our DML operations. So when you're running insert operations, uh, we are not changing existing micropartitions. We're typically just adding new micropartitions to the end. Um, now, the, uh, one of the cool pieces here is that's true for uh, both structured data as well as semi-structured data that you may, may load into Snowflake. No matter what you're using as the incoming data format, we are uh, converting that or transforming that into this optimized storage that's based on micropartitions. Um, and there's, there's no schema or no hints required um, to do that. And as soon as you submit a query, they will automatically benefit from, from that optimized uh, data structure. So you're getting the pruning and the filtering that we just talked about. So that's a, that's a bigger topic for us. So uh, we'd like to uh, make things as automatic as possible for our users. Um, uh, we talked about micropartitions. There is no distribution key that you have to define. Uh, we are doing that automatically for you. You don't have to worry about like a high availability configuration, failover between different virtual machines. All that comes automatically out of the box. There is no vacuum. You don't have to define specific statistics to make sure that your queries run fast. So all of that comes out of the box, virtually no knobs, and uh, the time to um, to see great performance for your workload um, is, is super small. So let me jump over into a quick demo so that you get a, a brief look of Snowflake in action. And what I would like to do in the demo is sh just show you one uh, particular aspect um, where Snowflake integrates into the Spark ecosystem. So we have a Spark connector that you can deploy into your Spark application that injects itself into um, the query uh, plan generation process of Spark to uh, give users a highly optimized experience when they're storing their data in Snowflake. So what I've done here, essentially, I've, I've taken about two gigabytes worth of tweets from Twitter, stored them into S3, and you can see those files here. Um, and let me jump over. Here I have um, a browser window with uh, some uh, queries over that data in Databricks. You can see here I'm populating a data frame with uh, the data that sits in the bucket in S3 over on the left. And you can see this is the schema that we're getting. It's all JSON, uh, lots of properties in here. If we are doing a count, you can see that it's about 3.2 uh, million different tweets that are contained in the data set that I have in the bucket. And if you squint, you can see that's uh, down there. It takes about half a minute to run the count operation. And running this on a two-node Spark cluster, so two compute nodes, one master node, pretty standard configuration, uh, just clicking through the cluster setup. And here's a little bit more involved query. So over these, uh, these tweets, I'm doing a group by the language property and then just counting to get the uh, most popular uh, languages for the different tweets. And you can see English and Japanese are awfully uh, popular here. Um, and again, if you squint, you see that takes about half a minute to, uh, to run. So uh, that's kind of interesting. Now let's take that same data set and bring it over into, uh, into Snowflake. Uh, and I've done that over here. You see a tweets table that lives in a Snowflake database. If I click on this, uh, you can see that we are storing the JSON in uh, a variant column. So this is our data type for this semi-structured uh, data like JSON and Parquet that I talked about that automatically does the translation into uh, the internal storage representation. Um, and now let's uh, jump back over here into a different browser window where I'm connected to a somewhat smaller cluster, just one compute node instead of two, and I'm connected to Snowflake. And let me run a couple of queries here against Snowflake. So this is the first one. So you're just checking if we can get a connection to um, my Snowflake warehouse, and it should um, hopefully just finish in a couple of seconds and spit out the current date. And you can see today is December the 11th. And you can also see that um, here, we are essentially telling the Spark read operation to run a query with current date against Snowflake. So let's do something uh, more interesting here. Uh, let's populate a data frame, this data frame, with all the rows in this table, the tweets table that we just looked at over on the left. Let's run this and then do the same count operation on it. And you can see here the, the JSON is coming back for the first couple of rows. Here's a count operation. In about two seconds, the same 3.2 
million JSON documents. Um, now here I'm running a, an actual Snowflake query to populate another data frame. And you can see here in the syntax, I'm using some of the built-in uh, Snowflake SQL constructs to work with semi-structured data in Snowflake. Let's send this off. And there you can see we're getting languages and some texts back. And now let's run this query here, which does, again, the same grouping by language and uh, counting the tweets um, per language. And you can see that uh, same result in about three and a half seconds uh, coming back. Um, now the nice thing again here is um, we're running a much smaller cluster uh, backed by a Snowflake warehouse. And you can see some of the performance benefits here, which, uh, uh, which are due to the, uh, to the internal optimizations that Snowflake does behind the scenes. And know that you literally have, uh, don't have to do any changes to your Spark applica application code. So the connector injects itself transparently into the plan generation process. Whatever transformations you do over your data frames, we'll look at them and figure out which ones are re relational in nature and backed by data that sits in Snowflake. And we'll automatically translate that into SQL queries that run over slow in Snowflake. We can take a quick look at this here. Uh, so here is uh, the SQL query for this that does the counting, and down here you see the group by language. So this is the SQL query that was automatically generated by the Spark connector when we, uh, uh, when we submitted that, that last group by uh, statement um, in, uh, in Spark. So with that, let me jump back in here. And uh, Great software um, only exists because of great engineers. So um, uh, obviously, being a sponsor talk, I wanted to show this for a minute. Uh, we, are, uh, we are hiring in, uh, into our development offices, one local here to the Seattle area, down in San Mateo, as well as in Berlin, Germany. Things that we are working on are uh, obviously performance. Uh, one of the most recent things in that space was uh, materialized views. Uh, which, uh, where we are taking a fairly fresh view on how to do materialized views for relational databases. Other areas that are of interest to us is the whole data science machine learning space and how do we best support these workloads from a Snowflake perspective. Um, uh, modern enterprise data architectures, like how do we integrate into application stacks like Spark, which we spent some time on today. And then obviously performance also for uh, our metadata layers um, and our cloud services, particular FDB uh, uh, for metadata scale. And then uh, also uh, um, increasing our footprint, growing into additional cloud regions, both in AWS as well as in Azure. Um, that's all I have for today. Thanks very much.